Okay. Uh, welcome to Kaplan. I'm Thomas. I'll be uh, teaching the level one and two uh, for kayak. So a few quick things about me. I worked f as an accountant uh, when I first started. And then I found finance much more interesting. So I jump shipped and then I do uh, eye banking for a while. So now I teach here uh, in various places in accounting, finance as well. Um, just now, Joanne asked, uh, anyone doing CFA or FRM or existing kayak uh, uh, candidates, either um, you haven't put up your hand or you're still considering. So um, here, for my part, I'll focus on more on what we do during class for kayak. Uh, but if you have other questions on deciding uh, which one is better for you, fits what you want to do better, uh, we have actually several experts here. Um, Florence, which talked uh, earlier, she came after me about other things like uh, cost and arrangements for the course. But they also do CFA and FRM program within the same umbrella. So she would know more about um, how things are going, if you're comparatively, uh, um, which one is most suitable, more details in how each one work. But from my perspective, I got my CFA first. Uh, so it's very useful. But if I look at what's being tested now, it's very, very difficult. Um, and it takes quite a long time. Uh, Kayak is also very good. It's complementary to what CFA does. But from my perspective, because I'm more in structure than derivatives, so I found it more interesting. There are more new things being designed, being thought up, being structured every day. And now it's all under um, alternative investment or more advanced finance. So although the, the pie in terms of jobs are not as many, but you normally find more satisfactory work just because you're more at a frontier level designing new things uh, versus um, just doing analysis of financial statements. Complementary to what Joanne also brought up, if you go to, uh, I think it is Bloomberg, just on their website, they have a list of all the jobs that are going to be replaced by uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and some traders are being one of them. Sales and trading, uh, FX traders, FX sales might be replaced by AI. So uh, here for Kayak, we look at different things uh, within the several asset class. We don't actually do great details. Just think of if you're doing, if you're looking at a, a trader or a private equity fund, uh, we can't really teach you what they do because that is their trade secret. That is why they do so well. They're not going to tell anyone what they do. They're not going to let you know who the connections are. That is for you to find out once you're in the firm, because everyone do things differently. But Kayak gives you something to start. So at least if you're in the industry, uh, you're doing private equity, you want to try out other things, you, you know what they do, and so you have a good head start in finding out what you really want to do. Right, so that's important because now everyone is investing in all of these asset classes. You seldom find any investors have only one focus. I only do private equity and that's it. So this will give you a good broad background to explore either jobs available or what you like to do. What is your real interest? Uh, so here, uh, this collaborates with what Joanne mentioned earlier. Uh, if you look at 10, 15 years ago, you don't find many investors. You might find, um, I guess, some family office uh, uh, in the US and a few wealthy families and people. But today, you have people buying this everywhere. Um, many of these products are even at the retail level. So if you go to, if you log into your HSBC account, you actually find structured products there, which you can buy just online without special uh, arrangements. So it's getting very mainstream. Uh, so job-wise, it's actually opening up to lots of opportunities. If you look at China today, they sell lots of structured products. And many of them are very, very strange. You walk in, you s I know it's a structured product, so I saw, so what does this do? And the person doesn't know anything. 
he called uh, he called his boss he doesn't know either so they were selling many things which were structured but they weren't really understanding the risk or the upside or what might happen so there might be or there should be lots of opportunities in just exploring and c covering these areas at least in Asia so um, here this would be what some of the members say uh, so after they get the uh, destination, it's practical, it's very useful. Um, without Kaya, if you do a CFA, you read many articles, you see uh, Bloomberg has many. If you go to their website, they have stories about uh, a trader making lots of money in five minutes and then lose it all in the next 10 minutes in Japan. And then some private equity funds are doing this in Asia and some are doing this in Europe. Without Kaya, you really don't know what they're talking about. You just know the term, but you won't know how they work. So it's really more um, uh, advanced level finance where you are keeping up with what people are doing. And these are people that have you know, the, the money, uh, their own money in the game, uh, and they're going for it. So it's interesting to know these and what they're doing. In terms of the course, um, if I compare, because I have FRM as well, so if, if I compare and have to redo all three again, it would be a dreadful process, because I took it a few years back, so it wasn't as difficult as today. If I look at all three, I would think Kayak would be the most useful in terms of the knowledge, but not at great in-depth level. So you're not going to do your accrual, finance, accrual accounting like in CFA for numbers which I'm not even sure what they do. I'm just following the process or I'm not going to do a, uh, a third derivatives model just to do the FRM pricing or risk management. I mean, they might use it real life, but uh, I mean, Kayak will have a good overview of what everyone does at an interesting level. In terms of studying, um, if we look at what's in the curriculum, if you take an FRM, CFA, and kayak book, um, we are like a storybook. <laughs> there will be some formulas, but those are not very difficult ones. And you see some later on, uh, most formulas look terrible because they were made to fit every numbers possible. That's why it so looks so bad. But once you know how they work, many uh, kayak questions, you can actually back out or eyeball answers if it's a multiple choice question. So it's not a hard process once you know how the formula work or how, what, what's being calculated. So in terms of level one and two, Joanne earlier mentioned there were five asset class covered in the curriculum in both levels. We have your private equity, right? That includes your venture cap and your LBO funds and a few other little things. Hedge funds, that would cover all the convertible bonds, your regular hedge funds, high frequency trading. We have real estate, real assets, and then uh, structure, which now includes uh, derivatives and credit risks and so on. In level one, you're looking at each one in a very introductory level. So we look at the style of hedge fund, what they do, not in great depth. And then in level two, you have the same five asset class, but now you have one or two area, which is the main focus. But of course, we assume you still know everything in level one. So in hedge funds, we'll focus on convertible bonds in level two. So be some in-depth calculations of how you price it how you arbitrage it, and how you hedge it once you have the position. Um, so it will be more in-depth, and there will be an essay part as well. So you'll be able to answer uh, uh, things that you know by not recalling the answer, like in a multiple choice. But if you, if I, when I talk to students that took the exam, uh, most actually finish it just in time. It's not a big rush, most have just enough time. They would finish, take a break, two minutes, and then look back. I never heard anyone that have not enough time. For the essay, uh, most finish it early. They don't really need three hours, um, except for a few which they haven't had time to study, 
and so they weren't they, they cannot see what the answer are because they haven't studied enough so they wrote quite a bit but generally it's not a very very difficult exam in terms of passing and and the scope of study so for level one two sessions as Joe mentioned just now all multiple choice you have about one close to two minutes like 1.8 minutes per MC question you may have thought that doesn't sound very a lot of time because I mean you're reading the question on the screen and that's already 30 seconds if I read quickly but uh, the questions are not all the same difficulty level so some are pretty relatively easy some would take more time so on average it's pretty comfortable time um, another very big good thing about kayak is we are straight guns I mean I want to know if you know the material I don't want to know uh, I don't want to trick you so our question if you do it you see the uh, you see the question you say oh that must be B it's so obvious just put in B don't worry too much um, when I taught CFA before many students come back and said well if I see a question and I see the answer right away it must be the wrong answer <laughs> I must look somewhere else here just I want to know if you know and it's not trick questions we never do so uh, timing wise you'll be comfortable you have enough time to finish there'll be some quali quantitative stuff but um, we only do the ones that apply to us so we're not going to do many different uh, difficult questions most of our quants are focusing on how you measure the risk because if you do your normal investment you might have normal distribution most AI have skewiness and ketosis with fat tail and so on so all those are just to make sure we got the risk right otherwise we don't do more than that right and then um, some level two material come in in level one you have a taste of what it look like and then level two will be in depth so there'll be like convertible bonds you know the conversion premium in level one level two you do the binomial tree having fun doing it so um, many descriptive as well in level two uh, one session is on essay it's on a computer screen but um, I think it's relatively easy to get used to and it's easy to do as well because you can copy and paste rearrange as you go so it's you, you, do, you don't have to think of plan the whole answer before you start writing right so it's a, a fan, advantageous arrangement um, the only difference might be in level two if I look at level one um, the questions are silos most of the time 95 percent so you have AI questions on hedge fund it's on hedge funds in level two there might be some cross asset questions so they uh, might ask uh, what risks are the same across different asset class because now you've done level one you know the basics from there anyway right but so more macro view between asset classes uh, the fees we've looked at uh, haven't passed the early bird yet so we still have about two weeks uh, pass rate um, uh, Joanne had mentioned before this sometimes we have uh, visitors for this for the seminar which um, didn't have time to study so they didn't do well and didn't pass and they come to the seminar thinking should I take the class um, and retake but even for uh, non-repeater, the first time you come, I think the same answer would apply. Um, if you want to do finance, just overall, doesn't matter what destination you take, for me, it's an interest, interesting business. There might be other few, but finance is one that is easy to understand, fun to do, and pay is okay. So here, um, I mentioned in the first two slides, opportunities, there are many. And one thing very good about AI or finance is um, you work hard, you are smart, uh, and you can see and feel the uh, recognition, either by having good performance or good pay. So it's not you work your butt off like in accounting, 
vouching things for three nights in a row and no one cares. Here, you do well, people know, you see your results. So if you are that type of person, it fits you perfectly. Opportunities, plenty as well. For us, um, if you look at our book, I don't think we have the original curriculum there. But if you look, the original book is about that thick, our book about the same thickness. So you might wonder, why pay money to listen to me? Um, so if you flip through, we try to focus on things that are hard to understand. Because many formulas you can study, can't understand what it's doing, and then you read it a second time, come back a third time, it, you'll click. So for me, some formulas I read, I tried, one month later, suddenly I'm sleeping, I wake up, all oh, right, that's how it works. It clicks for many of these finance, math stuff. Here, I help you click earlier. You don't have to spend two months reading over the same thing or the whole book. Um, here, you come one, one day, we go through, I help you click, so when you see the question, you know what it's asking. Because many times, you have to read everything to see how things link up and relate and get to the point. So here, you do it faster. Um, hopefully, you have a busy work life and family and outside life, so you won't have time studying, you know, reading this book over and over for, for five times before the exam. So uh, saving time is much better doing it here because we focus on the more difficult to understand or more likely test material. Yeah? So um, think about it. You can read through the book and see how the arrangement is. Um, so jumping back to, we have three practice questions, and this is a little bit of what, for the qualitative, I won't say much because it depends on how much, how fast you read, how you understand, and how good you answer these questions. But for calculation questions, um, I see two normal types. So some are difficult but mechanical. So you have to follow all the steps from how it's calculated to get to the answer. The other is very easy. One sentence, but it's more theoretical. So it's checking if you know what the concept does. These are some examples. So for private equity fees, it tends to be pretty complex compared to the other asset class, because it's like marriage. I commit to a private equity fund, I'm locked up for seven years. It's probably longer than most marriages. And so at that time, the guy took my money, I can't get it back. So I want some, uh, if I'm the investor, I want some protection. So many fees arrangements were done to make sure I get my money back or have some protection because I don't see it back in at least seven years. So many of these fees are offsetting, they are calculated on different basis, and so if you know how that works, then you can work through and find, oh, given this, this uh, waterfall and uh, hurdle rate, what fee is the manager getting given his ending NAV for the year? So there's no, like, there's no light bulb. Just plow through the calculations step by step and just do it. The other type are um, like binomial tree. The formula is not hard, but you have many output. You have your, uh, uh, you have your different uh, level of, um, I guess, skillness and things to account for. There are many things in the tree. If you do it a few times, you pick up how the concept work. And so these are on those. It will be a very simple question. So for example, uh, if your delta is this, what does it mean? Do you, uh, what do you do with it? if the number is high or low, or can it be negative, and so on. So it's not hard, just test if you know what's going on. Right? So major two types. Now in terms of questions, we have, I have five here. Um, of course, I cannot pick those that we haven't done. So here I'm trying to show you the easy ones you can actually get the answer for just by common sense. Many of these are like that, although you know, in an AI perspective it looks turbocharged, but most are just common sense, if it's my money, what do I do? First one, 
this is a little bit on qualitative. You have many like this. So if you look at a normal, if you look, if you look at your bond, uh, bond, bond class or your investment class, they do bonds investing. So in a regular level, you would say, oh, the bond defaulted, you don't get your money back, that's it. Here, we have more fine grading, because if you're doing CDS, is that you're buying health insurance. You want to buy the correct level for your protection, so you want to either buy full coverage, you sneeze, you see a doctor get money back, or you do severe illness, it's up to you, and the price is different. So same with our CDS or credit risk, I need to fine tune the risk level to determine when do I get my compensation for my protection. So here I'll go backwards. Three is your credit spread risk. So that is just normal fluctuations in interest rate, market condition. Most don't cover that, right? If you cannot take any credit risk, buy treasury bills. <laughs> Don't buy bonds, right? So normally, we, it's a term we used for the fluctuations of yield and price, but we normally don't cover those in CDS. Some might actually buy for downgrade risk. If you are a uh, investment grade bond fund, you cannot hold non-investment grade, right? So you might buy that level to protect a bond going from investment to, to non-investment grade, you can get protection from that. You don't have to rush and sell your bonds at a loss below market price. Some, of course, do default. Right? So here, there will be other calculations after this that focus on different levels, but we're not doing those here. But this is just to show many of the details in the course, in the curriculum, is just fine tuning because we're doing more advanced uh, uh, investments. So this is the first question. So I have lots of money. I'm a rich guy. So I decide to bid on the Murray Building. Or is that the name? This is on Garden Road, right? So I decided to bid on it, and I won. So I build my own building there, and I lease things out. So here is checking what happens if inflation suddenly go up very quickly, um, which is most like it benefits me. Right? So if I ask you and you put yourself in my shoes and think about it, so I built a building and I borrow money to build it, I sign long-term lease f to restaurants, maybe, um, maybe a few nice sh uh, uh, big shops and offices, so I sign long-term leases with the tenant with some CPI adjustment for an annual or partial increase in rent. right? So that is where I stand. So I'm checking if inflation go up unexpectedly. Which one benefits me? So which one should it be? A long lease term, does it benefit me? Actually, it doesn't, right? Because normal CPI adjustment is OK, but a sudden high inflation increase, my adjustment won't catch up. So I'm losing purchasing power. So it doesn't benefit me at all. It actually hurts me. For B, finance with adjustable rate mortgage. So my debt, so just part A is my revenue side, money coming in for my rent. Part B is my expense side, my interest expense on the loan. If rates go up unexpectedly, this is adjustable rate. So it go up as well because my margin goes up now. So it doesn't actually hurt me as well because my income stays low my expense jump up with inflation, so both actually hurt me, couldn't benefit me at all. C would be a fixed rate loan. This is just like if you buy your own house and you have a fixed rate mortgage, rates go up, then you're actually in the money because you're paying a fixed rate which is lower than the market rate. Right? So if you look at it from a personal or just a logic perspective, it's things you probably you, you understand anyway. This takes more into the investing and trading part. This is on um, commodities, uh, uh, futures, and options. So we have buyer and seller. 
this is really something in level one we do, and then more in level two. But looking at this, there's actually several, um, several binary points to figure out what the answers are without actually doing any calculations. So here, for any of these, there's always a buyer and a seller. You're either long or short. For CFA, uh, most or most investors look at, oh, I'm long this, I'm long that to make money. But AI, you actually make money both ways. If something is overpriced, you short it. Right? So here we're doing both ways of do I long or short, or do, what do I do with it? So here, we have this is best way to hedge. So it's one of the keywords. I'm not trying to make money. I'm not speculating. I'm not trying to maximize return. I'm trying to reduce my risk. So hedging is what I need to do. And this is a commodity producer. So this is, I have, let's say a commodity. This is, doesn't specify. So this is a farmer and he grows wheat or he raises pigs or he drills oil. The producer in the, like the raw material part we have the user. It's not covered here for the question, but in curriculum is I have the farmer and the user are the restaurants. Or if this is a farmer, it might be Kellogg that used the weed to make cereal, right? So I'm hedging investment in his debt. So what can I do? So first of all, this is for hedging. So purely based on a hedging perspective, you can never short any option for hedging. Because for hedging, you must buy options to have the choice for the protection, right? If you sell the option, then you are the <laughs> scapegoat pretty much. Someone in trouble, you are there and you pick up the slack. So selling options can never be any, be any hedging. So this one is out. So now I have three. B and C looks almost the same. So let's figure out, because it's either one or the other. It cannot be both. So let me see what this is doing. So I'm the farmer. This is the producer, the guy that drill oil, the guy that grows wheat or grow oranges. So for him, when he sell his oranges, the price that he receives is his revenue. Right, because he receives money. If here they say the user's debt, then from the user's perspective, they are buying the oranges, then it's their expense. Right, so depends on who the person is, the answer flips. But now in this question, it is the producer. So I'm looking at this guy here. I want protection. So his risk, whenever you have hedging, then you want to see where does he lose money? In this case, if the orange price go down, his revenue go down, expense stay the same, so he would go bankrupt, cannot pay off your debt. So what I need is I want to buy or sell something that makes money when the orange price go down. In this case, I buy put option that will fit the bill, right? I buy options orange price go down, I make money. So even if the guy defaulted, I still have money because now it covers my, my defaulted bond of this guy. Right? So this one, I know B is out. On the other hand, if the question asks the user, then you would buy the call option because if the orange price go down, expense go down for this company, it's not his risk. The user's risk is if the orange price go up, it's the expense, it's the input. So orange price go up, the catalog or the user's cost go up, they go bankrupt. So you would buy the call option if it is the user's view you asked. But here it's the, you buy the put. So now I have two choices. One is using options, one is using futures. So I guess both can hatch. But now we have one problem. So for the debt, what does it look like? My debt payoff is like this. 
right? If the company don't go bankrupt, I would earn my interest for sure, but no upside. That is what bonds does, right? If the company go defaulted, then my my value of the bond go down because now I'm the last person holding the bond. The more the firm value go down, the less I get back. So here, this is what I need to offset. If I short futures, then what do I look like? I will be like this, right? If I short the futures of orange, orange price go down, I make money. But then, this side I have a problem. Because I get the protection when the orange price go down. But if orange price go up, I'm actually Miss hedging because I'm losing money from my futures doesn't have protection. It actually hurts me when it goes the other way. So put is the only one that can give me this by having a profile like this. Right? So on the downside when I need it, it protects because it offset my loss. If orange price are okay, then I don't have any loss from a long put because I just don't exercise it. Right, so futures is possible, but you have to be, you know, watching it. If orange price come up here, you have to, uh, 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 I guess in the case, buy the futures back. Otherwise, you lose money. Right, so optimal D can work, but C is the best answer here. So if you look at this, the question is just a few things: Are you hedging or speculating? Is it producer or user? Is it debt or equity? Uh, so just a few binary points to get to what you need to do. Because now you know how this works. Any, any questions similar to this, any format you can answer now, right? Now this one, last one we'll do. So this is based on real estate. Because real estate actually don't get transacted. You get appraised price, so the price are smoothed. They are appraised price. When you want to sell or buy, it's probably not that one. So um, the other place it might happen is for private equity funds because they don't transact all the time as well. So here there's a lack. We don't have the formula here, but at the end, what this 0.6 mean is um, if I order pizza last night, so this is last night, and there are eight slides. And if this morning I saw three slides still left on the kitchen table, this is saying, oh, 0.6 is a proportion of that. What is the original pie last night? How many pieces? So here it's checking 0.6. There are different formulas to do this, but this 0.6 means the new price shown up. So in this case, we have an appraised price, which it's only estimated by the real estate agent. We don't know what the actual market price change would be. So based, this 0.6 is based on a autocorrelation uh, uh, regression. So it's checking if the price go from 20 to 32, there's a $12 increase in this appraised estimated price. This 0.6 is, or, or means, the $12 you see the increase of is 0.6 of the actual increase. Yeah? So if you go back, you don't have to actually calculate. Because if I know oh, this, this, let me see, I have two pieces of of pizza left, and you tell me that's 0.25 of the original, you can divide, and oh, there's eight pieces before. That is what it's asking, right? But here you don't have to. $12 is the increase. That's only 0.6 of the total. So total must be more than 12, right? If I look at the answer, below, 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 so only C is possible just on a directional side. Double check. 20 times 0.6 is 12, so the actual price change is near 20, and that's why it showed up in the appraised price that you asked for when you call up the real estate agent. Right? So all these, once you know what that number means, 
it's very easy to calculate. Yeah. The last two, I leave it to go home with. Uh, these, this question here is using a, uh, instead of using binomial tree, it's using the Black-Scholes pricing model to value the convertible. So it's very similar, except here they have the different uh, strike. So th this is not asking to calculate, but it's asking based on this black shoe option pricing model, what are you exchanging for what? So the strike price, whether it's the bonds value, or whether it is the stock price, is the main understanding of the theory. There's no calculation, it's just a regular black shoes formula, right? But knowing how to structure the calculation will be the main key. Because here it's used for the convertible, but many people use black shoes to value equity, which is the same approach. Yeah. So this one I'll let you read. This one is also a quantitative question, but asked in a qualitative way. So this is an interesting topic, which um, many uh, uh, funds are doing now. So most funds will do your, uh, your optimization in allocation. So they would take their sharp or a return to risk ratio to do optimization of what to buy. In, March, in level one, we have a new concept, which is, well, none of it comes up, but not many people do, do it, is I use risk to allocate. So I don't allocate based on the highest return to risk, based on the risk level. And so this is using valid risk to allocate my allocation of money. And I'm using my total valid risk as a pi. And so this is my total vow. I'm using 25% for equity, and then 25% of my risk for real estate. And so this is calculating that. So it's checking your total value versus your component and so on. So if you know how it fits, then this one is pretty straightforward to do. But this is probably what you see on the quantitative number calculated in the curriculum, but how it's asked qualitatively. Yeah, so this would be like the simple version of the, of the calculation question, which is asked, what are you adding up in the numbers? to get what you want.